we're in Rickery All, Oregon, which is in Polk County, and we're on property that was once owned by Nathaniel Ford. Uh, Nathaniel Ford was a uh, slaveholder, landholder in Missouri who came out to this area in 1844, and uh, he brought with him six slaves who helped him to farm this property. Uh, there were the fact there were slaves in Oregon was always a surprise to me, but uh, he brought out more than any other did, and he tried to keep them, and that's sort of part of the story. But this area was uh, part of the Willamette Valley, and this is land that uh, was very much of interest to farmers in Missouri and elsewhere because they could get up to a square mile of free land. And this is what drew the early settlers out to Oregon in the Willamette Valley, was the opportunity to get free land. Well, it was mostly, there were, were a few white people here. There were Native Americans, of course, the tribes. There were fur trappers, there were missionaries. Hudson's Bay Company had a big fur trapping operation up in the, on, on the Columbia River. But for the most part, it was very unpopulated uh, by settlers and whites. There were Native American tribes here. And uh, so the, the, uh, it was under joint occupation of the British and the Americans. They had uh, both had a claim to the land, and so there was no real government out here. And then in 1843, a provisional government was established, which was sort of the, kind of became the, the start of Oregon. And then uh, the U.S. Congress, two senators in the Congress, wanted to create a fait accompli on the ground to bring this under the American flag. So they began to develop legislation that provided a free square mile of land to the early settlers. And then this happened to coincide with a time when in Missouri in particular, the economy was in the tank. So it was Missouri settlers who were among the first to come out in the major wagon trains in 1843 and 1844. And Ford was a big, big deal in Missouri. He was a member of the Missouri legislature, a four-time county sheriff of Howard County in uh, central Missouri, probably growing hemp and tobacco on his major land holdings there, and had up to 13 slaves. And then when his economy went into the tank, he organized his own wagon train and uh, brought them out here and settled on this land, which you, you see around me. Most of the early settlers who came out from Missouri, we're talking about the Missouri settlers who made up the large proportion of the early settlers, were both anti-slavery and anti-black. Many of them had, uh, had never had slaves and found it very difficult to compete in a slave culture against slaveholders who had slaves. So they were fleeing slavery in a way. At the same time, they identified African Americans with slavery. So the idea was, we don't want African Americans here, period. Not as slaves, not as people who would compete for our jobs. And so this was uh, what was behind what was one of three exclusion laws in Oregon's history, which banned African Americans from living here. But it turned out the law wasn't enforced. And so some of the early settlers did bring slaves to help them get their huge farms started. Some of them uh, set them free right away, and others, like Nathaniel Ford, kept his for quite some time. Robin and Polly Holmes were a family that had been with the Fords in Missouri. They'd been uh, had owned by other owners, and uh, Ford bought them probably about 1831, and they had several children. And uh, it was, you know, I went through, had, had a researcher go through the records, the slave records in Missouri for me, and the buying and trading. And so Nathaniel Ford was dealing slaves all the time, and he traded away three of the Holmes family children, you know, to settle some of his debts. And so he brought out six slaves, and they were five members of the Holmes family, Robin and Polly, and three of their children, and the sixth adult slave named Scott. And so he made a deal. You come to Oregon, and I'll help me get my farm started, and I will give you your freedom. So they came out in 1844, and they helped them develop this land all around here, growing wheat, and they had cattle, and all the things that, uh, and corn, and the things that farmers in Oregon had in those days. By, by 1850, six years after he'd come out here, um, Robin, Robin knew that slavery was supposed to be illegal in Oregon, so he was agitating, probably had some support, some support from abolitionists, agitating for his freedom. You promised, give us our freedom. So Ford made a yet another deal with him. He said, well, you go to California and mine gold for me. This was, this was the gold rush days. Then when you come back, I will give you your freedom. He made the same deal with Scott. 
of who was a sick slave that came out. So Robin and Scott went to California. They did mine gold for him. And then on the return trip, Scott unfortunately drowned at, uh, at sea in, uh, in a shipping accident. Robin came back, and Ford did give Robin and Polly their freedom, but he kept their children. This time there were four children. And so two more years went by. One of the children had died, and Robin Holmes was concerned for the, the safety of his children. The family hadn't been able to see them for a couple of years, and so he filed suit against uh, Nathaniel Ford for the freedom of his children. People knew that in 1843 the provisional government had, had declared slavery illegal. So apparently, and we don't know this for sure, most of those who brought slaves made that kind of a deal with their, their, their slave, knowing that they, or assuming they couldn't keep their slave here because, because it was illegal. Well, the law was changed in 1844, and not a lot of people know this, but Nathaniel Ford did, which allowed slaveholders, originally the 43 law was no slavery period. But in 1844, because of the work of a fellow named Peter Burnett, who later became governor of California, the law was changed so that male slaves had, you could keep your male slave for two years and your female slave for three years and then free them. And that law also had an exclusion clause in it, which provided for lashing. So if that slave were freed and didn't leave Oregon within a certain amount of time, they could be subject to whipping, lashing, up to 39 lashes. Now, it's not clear that was ever executed. Now, this is the only slavery case ever adjudicated in Oregon courts. And I contend that to Holmes is really one of the unsung heroes in Oregon for several reasons. When you think about it, he was illiterate. Of course, slaves were deprived of education, and so all those who came, as they were throughout the rest of the country, pretty, most of them illiterate, knew nothing about Oregon law. I mean, how would he know? Pretty much isolated. There were very few blacks, racially isolated. In fact, this area around here was known as Dixie during the Civil War, which gives you some idea, you know, of the sentiments, you know, of this community. He, uh, he managed to get a... Uh, help from a prosecuting attorney who came from Massachusetts, an abolitionist state, a fellow named Reuben Boyce. So the Dallas County, the courthouse where the trial was adjudicated is just down the road here, about 10 miles in the little town of Dallas. So Reuben Boyce took, uh, took uh, Robin Holmes' case and helped him with it. It was not a, a jury trial. It was done before a judge, a bench trial, I guess you would say, and it dragged on for 15 months. And uh, I found the original trial record in the Polk County Courthouse in, in Dallas, which is very nearby here. And it's very interesting, Tiffany. It's almost an inch thick. I mean, they, they copied it for me from, from microfilm. But it's all handwritten by different people. And you have all these editing in it, all these scratchings, words crossed out, new words inserted, changes made. And you could just imagine that as these, 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 uh, uh, transcripts were made that since Robin Holmes was giving his testimony orally to a clerk or to an attorney, they were writing it down and then reading it back to him. And so I imagined that these were changes. He said, no, that's not quite right. You know, this, this, is, this is what we need to say, that kind of thing. So it was rather poignant, you know, that way. Three different judges heard the case. None of them wanted to, to decide it. And they were in a dilemma. By this time, Nathaniel Ford had already been elected to the Oregon Territorial Legislature. He was a big man. He'd been uh, nominated or appointed chief judge of Oregon. He declined to serve, but he was, had been appointed to that position in an area which was ostensibly fairly pro-slavery. And so he had, uh, but Boyce took on this case, and uh, it, like I say, it dragged on for 15 months, and then a new judge was appointed chief justice of the Territorial Supreme Court was a fellow named George Williams. Never been in Oregon before, originally from New York, uh, anti-slavery. So he came out and within weeks he decided the case for Robin Holmes. Well, for one thing, there was not a lot of reporting of, of the case at the time. There weren't many newspapers in Oregon. Certainly not newspapers are doing any in-depth or interpretive coverage. So a local Salem newspaper did carry a few paragraphs on the ruling. But in later years, George Williams himself commented on it, and he had hoped 
to be one of Oregon's first U.S. senators, and he had said, this kept me from being a senator. He said there was, I think there's a quote, he said there was, there were many virulent pro-slavery people in the territory, and this was very unpopular with them, that's the way he put it. So we can only imagine what the reaction was. In this community, it would have been very, very negative because we know the attitude in this community. Elsewhere in Benton County, which named their school union during the Civil War, sentiments were, were significantly different. Um, so you had different reactions in different communities. Robin went on to be a, uh, he operated, let's see, after he was freed in 1850, he worked in a grist mill, which is very nearby here. And he was working there at the time of the trial. And after the trial, he moved with, him and Polly moved with some of the children to Salem, near Salem, where they operated a nursery, and apparently successful, according to, to what we know about it. And he bought a plot of land for a cemetery plot in the Salem, what is now the Salem Pioneer Cemetery. And he is buried there, along with a lot of other African Americans, some of his children. And we know he bought the, the, lot, the plot. We don't know exactly where he was buried there. And there's no gravestone for him. But in 2007, an organization here called Oregon Black Pioneers, descendants of the early black, uh, black settlers, you know, erected a monument, not a monument, a grave marker for all the people who were buried in the cemetery who were African Americans. And his name is there. Polly apparently ended up in a, uh, in an institution. She apparently had some mental problems, so we don't know exactly when she passed away. I had written an er earlier book called Massacred for Gold about a Chinese massacre in Oregon, published by Oregon State Press, and it was very well received, and so I wanted to do another book. So I had several ideas, and uh, so I bounced these off my brother Bill one day, <clears throat> and he kind of dismissed each one politely and said, why don't you write about Reuben Shipley? And when I said, who was Reuben Shipley? And he said he was a slave brought to Oregon by one of our ancestors from Missouri in 1853. Well, I was dismayed for a couple of reasons. One, I had no idea there was any slave history in the background of the family. Most of the family came through Iowa. And then I had no idea there were ever black slaves in Oregon. There was a couple of reasons for me doing this book, Stephanie. One, to address my own family issues, in other words, I can't say that, uh, that I feel great guilt because of, there was an ancestor in the background that owned, uh, that owned a slave, but it's, it's something, you know, it's, it, 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 I, I don't like hearing it, I don't, and I wanted to know about it. So that's one of the reasons I began to pursue this story. The second one was, there's a certain smugness in Oregon that I have shared in the past, we're kind of a little bit better than the people in the South, we didn't have slaves here, we're kind of, liberal culture, you know, if sort of humanitarian oriented. And I had not known about this background. And um, so it's just kind of a, a, a big dark secret in Oregon's past. And it's not that much in the past either when you come right down to it. So I feel it's, it's something that people needed to know. And so uh, that became my book.